during the first day. Um, welcome, everybody. Chris, could you take this down just a touch? First of all, Happy Easter. We will do a more formal liturgical greeting of Easter when we open formally. It was good to have you all here tonight, as it has been at the different things that we've done since last Sunday. This feels always like the beginning of something new, because it is yet again. And just before we move into the liturgy, we're aware that we need to uh, acknowledge the land and include the folks who are online, because not all of them come from Treaty 1 territory. In fact, some of you may be coming in from the United States, where some of these treaty things are not as familiar. But here, we do want to acknowledge that this church building stands in Treaty 1 land. This is the historic homeland of the uh, Anishinaabe, Cree, and Dakota peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. But because other folks are joining us, we just want everybody to pause for a moment as a sign of our respect and our honor for those treaties. Alleluia, 
that Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Be saved. But he did not go in. 
Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to, the, to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabbanai, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father, and your Father to my God, and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Because he'd been working with an image that looked as the script at the scripture as being a film, a long film, certainly, with all sorts of unexpected turns and detours along the way, but a film that we have to watch again and again and again. No fair stopping at some point in the middle, he told me landing on one verse or one episode and saying, aha, that's the key to it all. No, we keep watching the film from beginning to end, keep telling the story week by week, month by month, year by year, and then out of nowhere something will hit us afresh. I mean, I know the resurrection story, and I, and I know it quite well. I've been preaching it for over 35 years, and I studied the Gospels formally for three years in theological college before that, 
to say nothing of all the years of growing up in the church and hearing the stories again and again and again. But time and again, when I sit down to work through what I might have to offer this year, I'll see something I'd not noticed before. Or, or, or perhaps I'll see something in a new way, which is just as significant. Now this year we've opted to proclaim the resurrection story from the Gospel according to St. John. So it's worth saying that each of the four Gospel accounts has its own unique character. No surprise here, but just to keep that in mind. The figures involved can vary a bit from Gospel to Gospel. And the emphasis of each in the resurrection can be quite unique. I've made this point before, but, but it really is worth repeating this evening. While modern sensibilities imagine that a historical account is meant to line up very neatly all of the details and all of the facts, an ancient understanding of history is quite different. The understanding that our Gospel writers came with. What the Gospel writers sought to do is to tell us about the meaning and significance of the event, and not narrowly the nuts and bolts sorts of details. So this account tonight brings us features, including the presence of the beloved disciple, which is John himself. I mean, John is writing it, and, and he never refers to himself as John. It's always as the beloved disciple, the one Jesus loved. He's not included in the resurrection appearances of the other three gospel writers. And there is that fascinating set of details related to Peter and John running together to the tomb, and John gets way ahead, but he waits there and lets Peter go in first. What's that about? Well, in the view of Raymond Brown, the great scholar of John's Gospel and John's epistles, it was meant to say, that while John led a Christian movement that was somewhat independent of Peter and of Jerusalem, he was here saying that he was recognizing the priority of Peter, the priority of the Jerusalem-based church, the church which had commissioned St. Paul and so stood at the heart of the whole Christian movement. And in the way he tells the resurrection story, he's making it very clear. And yet, it's not as if the account is meant to do only that. For John is saying something about his own radical transformation in light of the resurrection of Jesus. Here, Bishop N.T. Wright drills down on the phrase that we heard read, he saw and believed. John entered the tomb and he saw and believed. This is how Bishop Wright describes that moment. Oh, John had had faith before. He had believed that Jesus was the Messiah. He had believed that God had sent him and that he was God's man for God's people and God's world. But this was different. He saw and believed. Believed that new creation had begun believed that the world had turned the corner out of its long winter into spring at last. This is what the resurrection meant to John, and what it must mean for all who read his gospel account. New creation had begun, has begun, and for all that the world still struggles, for all that we can despair sometimes at the state of things, in that moment, that resurrection moment, new creation came into our midst. Then the two of them returned to where the other disciples were still in hiding, bringing with them these fragments of a, a bigger story, a still unfolding story. 
For as yet they did not understand the scripture. They needed more. This will come in time when together the disciples will have a more fulsome experience of the risen Christ. That leaves Mary Magdalene alone in the garden, weeping and feeling lost. She wept, John tells us. She bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head, the other at the feet. The angel said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. She's still reeling. She still hasn't even begun to get her head around the fact that that death has not had the final word. And who can blame her? Then comes that moment when she turns away from the tomb and sees Jesus, who also asks her why she's weeping. She doesn't recognize him. That happens often in these resurrection accounts, right? They, they don't recognize him at first. People see, but they don't really know what they're seeing. Maybe the tears are too thick. Or their minds are a little too thick, and that's there too. So the frame of what's happening is just impossible. Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you carry him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Supposing him to be the gardener, which is an extraordinarily poignant mistake to make because she's not entirely off target. I mean, he's not literally the gardener who tends this area where the tomb is located, but at another level he is absolutely the gardener of the new creation. He is the one who has planted something new right in the midst of the thorns and weeds of the empire-dominated world. He will see to the blooming of blossoms and the harvesting of grain, even in a world still held in captivity by Rome and its emperors. He will inspire people to do things beautiful and brave and lovely, even through the hardest of times. Christ is indeed a gardener, the gardener, the new Adam. Then she recognizes him. And with eyes wide, she exclaims, Rabboni, teacher. And as John pictures things, she must have been moving to grasp onto him because right away he says to her, Do not hold on to me because I have not ascended to the Father which has often struck me as a little unfortunate. I mean, I, I, I wanted Jesus to just embrace her and let her laugh and cry and rejoice and do it all at once, if only for a few moments. But no, it's don't hold on to me, Mary. Go to the disciples and tell them that I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And on this, William Temple, a very well-known Archbishop of Canterbury in the middle of the 20th century, and a very fine theologian and biblical scholar, William Temple offers an important reflection. He writes that while a great embrace between Mary and Jesus might have been expected, quote, in a profounder sense, this was the inauguration of a fuller union. In the days of his earthly ministry, only those could speak to him who came where he was. But his ascension means that he is perfectly united with God. We are with him because we are present to God. And that is everywhere and always. 
Because he is in heaven, he is everywhere on earth. Because he is ascended, he is here now. Hear that again, just the last couple of lines. We are with him wherever we are present to God. That is everywhere and always. Because he is in heaven, he is everywhere on earth. Because he is ascended, he is here now. And he is. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. shouts of joy, Hosanna to the King of Kings. Throngs of believers filled the streets and rulers trembled. Christ was betrayed, arrested, and denied, and those closest to him did not understand. Christ was mocked and sentenced and died, and those closest to him did not understand. Christ was laid in a tomb. But stone could not hold the one who sculpted stone, earth could not hold the one who formed it, and death could not hold the one who created life. Hell shook with fear and humankind was set free. Heaven and earth were joined together and Christ, through his death and resurrection, brought us all to new life. Tonight we join with each other and with Christians around the world as we pray for this new creation. We pray for those who came to greet Christ singing Hosanna. We pray for the faithful around the world as today they sing their alleluias. We pray for newly baptized Christians and for those who support them. We pray for the Anglican Church of Canada and the Anglican Communion worldwide. We pray for Linda, our primate, Gregory, our Metropolitan, Jeff, our Bishop, and for religious leaders of all faiths around the world. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord of glory. We pray for all who minister in our community of St. Ben's. For Jamie, Andrew, Sarah, Charles, and Gord. Pray for all members of the kitchen table, and for the many volunteers who made St. Ben's possible. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord of glory. We pray for the rulers of the time of Christ and for all in positions of authority today. Pray for Charles, our King, for Justin, our Prime Minister, Heather, our Premier, and Scott, our Mayor. We pray for elected officials throughout Canada and around the world. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord, Lord. We pray for those believers who filled the streets of Jerusalem and sought healing from Christ. And today for those who seek healing or are in any kind of need. And we take a moment to name silently or aloud those whose needs are known to us. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord. We pray for those who witnessed Christ's crucifixion and who saw the open tomb. For the disciples and for those who felt the anguish and confusion of loss. 
And we pray for all today who mourn. We pray for those who watch and wait, and for those who minister to the sick and the grieving. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord, glory. We pray for those who betray Christ and for the ones who do not understand. We pray for ourselves in our lack of understanding, in our fear, and in our betrayal and denial. And we take a moment silently to pray for our own needs. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord, glory. We pray for those who saw the risen Christ, for Mary, whose weeping at the empty tomb turned turn to joy at her recognition, recognition of the risen Christ. We pray for our own celebrations and for our moments of joy in our own lives and in the lives of those around us. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord, Lord. Loving God, accept these our prayers. Show us your face once more, and let us rejoice in the light of this new day, forever praising you and saying, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Amen. In a time of stillness, I invite you to speak to God of that in your own life that's born of sin, or of your fears, or of your wounds. Things done, better left undone, or those things we fail to do, people we can't quite manage to be. I invite you to confess the shape of your life to an almighty, yet merciful. We speak the truth of our lives to God, God who is merciful and just. We're reconciled and brought home again and again and again. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sin. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We rise. Peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Exchange a greeting of peace with those close around you. You may be seated as the table is set for communion and we sing.
Now, I will wear a mask when I'm standing over the bread and wine that everybody is going to receive, because that's just smart. Um, but when we come forward for communion, if for people who have not been here before, this, this will be a sort of a new way of doing it, we come into one great big semicircle on this side. So you come down the aisle all the way around to sort of the foot of the stairs. And, uh, but as you, if you wish to receive wine as well as the bread, as you come by the front pew, please pick up one of the little individual cups, which will be filled for you. We should have enough for everybody here who wants to receive. If, however, we get to the last five or six people and there's no little cups left, do know that from a theological point of view, receiving just the bread is still communion. So don't feel hurt. Um, just, just kind of a warning on a bigger night like this. The other thing is though, that if you are gluten intolerant, that just let uh, the person who is administering the bread know, and they will be able to offer you a gluten-free alternative. Everybody is most welcome to participate tonight. Nobody should feel obligation, but know there is a place for you at this table in this circle. I invite you to stand. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. We give you thanks and praise, Almighty God, through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer. He is your living Word through whom you have created all things. By the power of the Holy Spirit into flesh of the Virgin Mary and shared our human nature. He lived and died as one of us to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. In fulfillment of your will, he stretched out his hands in suffering to bring release to those who place their hope in you. And so he won for you this holy people. He chose to bear our griefs and sorrows and to give up his life on the cross, that he might shatter the chains of evil and death and banish the darkness of sin and despair. By his resurrection, he brings us into the light of your presence. And now, with all creation, we raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name.
And we ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon the offering of your Holy Church, gather into one all who share in these sacred mysteries, filling us with your Holy Spirit and confirming our faith in the truth, that together we may praise you and give you glory through your servant, Jesus Christ. All glory and honor are yours, Father and Son, with the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Church, now and forever. Amen. Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. This is the body of Christ. Behold what you are. Become what you receive. Amen. This is the table not merely of the church, but of Christ. It's made ready for those who love him and for those who want to love him more. So come. Whether you have much faith or little, have tried to follow or afraid you fail, come. Because it is his will that those who want to meet him might meet him here. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Also, uh, I want to add that uh, in offering the Eucharist in celebration tonight, it's always offered to the glory of God. But I know for me and for a few others of us here, it's also in memory of a dear friend, um, a guy named Byron O'Donnell, friend of Larry's, friend of Steve's. Uh, musician, long, long track record in the local music scene, kind of had a pretty broken life, and then he didn't. And uh, he started coming here in about 2008, and then he had to move to Dryden, but decided he still wanted to be baptized, and I did long distance baptismal prep with him, and then we drove out there one day and had lunch, and talked through all this stuff he'd been reading. Then he came in, it was January 10th, 2020. And he came in to be baptized. And that night there was Byron, who was uh, at that point in his 60s. And there was a wee little newborn baby. And I will never forget Byron coming to me right before the liturgy began. And he just met this couple and their baby. And he turned to me and said, isn't that something? A beautiful new little baby and a grizzled old sinner. Baptized on the same night. And isn't it something? So this is offered in Byron's memory and with prayers for his son. Will. May he rest in peace and rise in glory. Amen.
invite you to rise. Almighty God, we give you thanks that when we were still far off, you led us in your Son and you brought us home. Dying and living, he restored us to life, and by his grace, he opened the way of glory. And so we say, glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be amongst you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Please be seated for just a moment. Uh, the only announcement that's on the song sheet, because there's very little room at the bottom, is the fact that I, I'm going away um, tomorrow for, uh, we're going for five days uh, to Falcon Lake, to my daughter's cottage, to be kind of away in respite and rest zone. And, uh, so, I'm not going to answer email, but you can always email Sarah if there's something pressing, and I will answer everything when we get back, uh, so, but I would also just want to say that there is, for the folks who take part in our wellness group, there is a wellness gathering on Zoom on Wednesday, everybody got that announcement who's on our list, but if you want to know a little bit more about what that group is, or or, or how you might want to plug in. It's, it's just sort of support and care, essentially, for people through all of the ups and downs of life. Um, you can email me because I, my email doesn't get shut off until after I get the sermon podcast up tomorrow morning. So, like, you have till maybe 9.30 in the morning. Give it a shot. And then, just to remind you that Easter is not simply a day. But it is, in fact, a 50-day season, um, intentionally longer than Lent. But it also tracks Luke's chronology, right? It's 40 days till the Ascension, then another 10 days till Pentecost. So Easter time is that block of time. So we stay with lots of hallelujahs and in a celebra celebratory mode and looking at more resurrection narratives and then moving into images of Jesus as the shepherd and so on. So it is, it, whereas Lent can feel heavy, Easter, Easter has built into it a kind of a, an affirmation and, and uh, an embrace of light and life. So if you're visiting here for the first time, just keep coming back. We've got more and more and more. And welcome if you are here for the first time, or maybe the first time in a long time. Let's stand and sing our way.
rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia.